Hello, beautiful souls. My name is Carolyn and I'm abnormal and I like to talk about abnormal things. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. We talk about all things true crime, conspiracy theories, and anything abnormal. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much. I love you. So let's jump right into the story because I've got a wild one for you today. Marjorie Orban. Marjorie's case took place just four years and seven months after Valerie Pape. If you haven't watched the Valerie Pape video, I highly recommend going back and watching it. The two cases are not connected at all, so you don't need to watch it before you watch this video, but it's definitely a very interesting story. Both stories took place in Scottsdale, Arizona, and both of the bodies were found in very similar conditions. Marjorie Orban led an extraordinary life to hear her tell it. To call her just a stripper, it would not be fair. She was a extremely talented dancer and a Vegas showgirl and a choreographer. And through this video, I'll be referring to her as a stripper. I mean, absolutely no disrespect, no judgment using that term. I know a couple people <laughs> who have been strippers and that's the term they've used to refer to what they did. Marjorie started her dancing career at just 18 in Orlando, Florida. Well, she danced at a downtown tourist attraction called Church Street Station. She performed line dancing, jazz numbers, and clog routines. Marjorie was extremely ambitious and within a year she was choreographing routines and she was promoted to manager of another location called Cheyenne Station. Marjorie had always dreamed of being a mother, but at the age of 18, she was diagnosed with endometriosis. Endometriosis is a painful disorder that affects the lining of the uterus. Having endometriosis for some women can make it extremely difficult to have children, or sometimes they're not able to have children at all. I also know other women with endometriosis who were able to have children with no difficulty. So depending on the situation, some women are able to have children, some need assistance in having children, and some just simply are not able to have children. But at the age of 18, Marjorie was told she would never be able to get pregnant. And at that moment, Marjorie decided she would live her life for herself. She was going to do whatever she wanted to do, and she had nothing holding her back. She could focus 100% of her energy on herself. And Marjorie was quoted as saying, I can walk out of any situation. That may sound cold and callous, but the only person I need to worry about was me. Marjorie's relationships seemed to come in one after the other, and she was constantly jumping from man to man. By the time she was 35, she had been married and divorced six times. And most of the times before she had ended her marriage, she had already found a new lover. So she would find the new lover and then decided she wanted a divorce. In 1985, before the ink was even dry on her latest divorce, Marjorie found herself living with a hairdresser named Luke. Luke came from a very rich family that offered him a free condo if he would move back to Cincinnati where the family was living. Marjorie quit her job, jumped in the car, and they headed to drive across the country to Cincinnati. As they were driving, Luke got noticed that the condo wouldn't be ready for another month. So Luke suggested them temporarily stopping in Las Vegas for a month while they waited for the condo to be finished. He had friends with a salon in Las Vegas that he could work at temporarily while they were waiting. Luke ended up gambling away his $8,000 in savings and the salon job was non-existent. So Marjorie packed up her car and decided to head back to Florida. Because with Marjorie, if they don't have money, she's not sticking around. As she drove through Phoenix, Arizona, her car broke down and she went, took it to a mechanic shop and she needed a very expensive part to fix the car and it would take up to 10 days to fix the car once she could afford the part. At this point, she did not have the money to be able to purchase the part needed to fix the car. 
Marjorie was unsure how she was going to come up with the money to pay to fix the car when she noticed a strip club called Bourbon Street Circus. So she went in and applied for a job. At this point, she had never been a stripper before, but she was very confident that she could be a stripper and be very successful at it. She was classically trained in dance and soon found that she could work the pole better than any of the other ladies working there. Marjorie was fabulous. She was beautiful. She had blonde platinum long hair. She had long legs and an amazing body, which made her very attractive to a lot of the patrons. Within days, she was easily the most popular dancer at the club. The patrons were infatuated with Marjorie. She was making between five and $600 a night. And one of those patrons was 26 year old Jay Orban. Jay Orban was a regular at Bourbon Street Circus, almost every other strip club in the Phoenix area. He was well known by the strippers and the club's management as one of the best customers. When Jay went into a club, he spent big money. This made him very attractive to the dancers as well as the club's management. Jay, Jay was known for not having the best fashion sense. He wasn't in great shape. He was known for his balding black curly hair, rosy cheeks, cowboy boots, and diamond pinky ring. He came across looking like a used car salesman. And in all my research, that's how he was described. He looked like a used car salesman. And I don't know how used car salesmen got such a bad rep because it's a good, honest paying job. I don't understand why there's this image of like used car salesmen as these like sleazy people. Um, I know someone who's a used car salesman and he's not sleazy at all. But um, yeah, I'm just, he, that's how he was described, described as a used car salesman and it was meant in a derogatory way when it was used. But according to his friends, Jay was funny, he was charming, and he had a heart of gold. Jay had his own international business selling Native American turquoise jewelry, maps, and bows and arrows. This is a job that took him all over the country, sometimes internationally as well. He was out of town three out of four weeks of the month, and he was well known in strip clubs all across the country. Many strippers really liked Jay because he was a big spender, but Jay was captivated by Marjorie. He would come in to see her dance and buy her drinks every chance he got. Jay would often try to get Marjorie to see him outside of the club, but Marjorie had no interest in Jay. But he persisted and he persisted. And after two months, Marjorie finally decided that she would go on an afternoon date with Jay. And despite the fact that she did go on a date with him, she was not attracted to him. She had absolutely no interest in him. Eventually, he paid to have her car fixed and offered for her to move into his home. Marjorie had been staying in a motel and Jay offered her a spare room to live at his home for free. He was also gone most of the time traveling for work, so she did agree to move into his home. Though Jay tried to get Marjorie to be romantic with him, she simply had no interest in him at all. At one point, he even proposed marriage, but Marjorie wanted bigger and better things for herself, so she eventually moved back to Florida, and the two of them lost contact. Well, back in Florida, Marjorie started dating a man named Michael J. Peter. And Michael was well known all around the world for transforming strip clubs. He took the industry from taboo to mainstream. He had bought strip clubs all over the world and made billions. For a short time, the two were engaged. Marjorie traveled the world with him and he even got her a role in a really horrible movie. <laughs> 
apparently the movie, I don't even know the name of the movie, but it's always referred to as an unwatchable movie. So I don't know, it was a bad movie. He also got her a small spot in Motley Crue's music video, Girls, Girls, Girls. And Girls, Girls, Girls became an anthem in strip clubs all over the world. Michael was paying Marjorie to be the choreographer in his strip clubs. But just like every other relationship that Marjorie ever had, it didn't last long. The two stayed on good terms, but Marjorie decided to go back to Las Vegas. Years later, in 1993, Jay Orban, so Jay Orban is the man we were speaking about earlier that was infatuated with her, was driving through Las Vegas. And as Jay was driving through Las Vegas, he noticed a big billboard for Vegas showgirls and he instantly recognized Marjorie. He was very excited and bought tickets for the show that night. In the years that had passed, Marjorie had become a Vegas showgirl and did a lot of choreography work. The two met and Jay realized he still had the same feelings for Marjorie that he had in the past. Both Marjorie and Jay were making very good money but Marjorie still didn't have the one thing she really wanted, and that was to have a child. Jay proposed again, but this time he had a plan. He told her she could move to Scottsdale, Arizona, quit stripping, and he would pay for fertility treatments until she did get pregnant. And Marjorie liked this idea. And in 1994, Jay and Marjorie got married at the Little White Wedding Chapel in Las Vegas. You know that same little chapel that celebrities seem to like to get married at? Frank Sinatra got married there, Judy Garland, Britney Spears. Lots of celebrities got married there and Marjorie and Jay loved that. Despite her diagnosis, the treatments worked and she got pregnant with her son in August 1996 and she had a healthy pregnancy and gave birth to a little boy named Noah. Their relationship was going very well, but Marjorie had a very sizable debt and the IRS was after her. To protect Jay's business assets, the two divorced so the IRS could not seize any of Jay's business assets, but they did stay together. For almost 10 years, Marjorie lived an ordinary life raising her son and Jay was always away on business. So this caused their relationship to last a lot longer than her relationships in the past. But eventually like the others, Marjorie became bored and started looking for new men. Her infidelity started in 2004, the first of which was her son's karate instructor who was only 18 years of age. The second was a 60 year old bodybuilder who she met at the gym. His name was Larry Weinberg. Remember him? Cause he's going to be in the rest of the story with us. And with Jay being on the road three out of four weeks of the month, it was really easy for Marjorie to hide her affairs. While Jay was gone, Larry would live full time in the home with Marjorie and her son. I found this part of the story very confusing because was she not worried that the son would tell his dad? Like she, he would go off to work and Larry would move in and live full time with her and her son. And I don't know, she must have asked the son to keep it quiet. I, I'm not really sure how that worked. I just found it strange that she's living in the house with her son and this man comes and lives three weeks out of the month. And then one week of the month, his dad comes and lives and the son doesn't tell the dad. So the whole thing I found really weird, but Marjorie is very weird. August 28th, 2004 was Noah's birthday. And after his birthday party, Jay was on the road again. Since Jay had gotten on the road heading to Florida, Hurricane and Francis had become too large and he turned around and headed back home. With this change, it meant that he could be home by September 8th, which was his birthday. On 
September 8th, as he pulled into the Phoenix area, he called his parents to let them know that he was almost home. He spoke frequently to his parents and he said that he was almost home and he would call them when he did get home. His parents would never receive that call. Over the next week, when family and friends hadn't heard from Jay on his birthday, they started to get worried, but Marjorie was not worried at all. Marjorie said that he had never returned home, that he had ended up going on another sales job and wouldn't be home until September 22nd. She told family and friends she had not seen him since August 28th at their son's birthday party. In the weeks that followed, Jay's family and friends became extremely concerned about where he was. He, he wasn't calling anyone. Nobody would call him and be able to get a hold of him, but Marjorie wasn't concerned at all. On September 20th, several of Jay's friends received a call from Jay's cell phone, but there was no one on the other end of the line. When September 22nd rolled around and Jay still wasn't home, family and friends pressured Marjorie into contacting the police. Though Marjorie was reluctant, she did contact the police to file a missing persons report. Though Marjorie had reported Jay missing, she was not available to police to discuss anything to do with his disappearance. Police needed the license plate number from Jay's Ford Bronco so they could use plate recognition to try to find his vehicle. By September 28th, police had left many messages for Marjorie that she just never returned. Finally, Detective Jay Butcher, who was on the case, finally got a hold of Marjorie, but the conversation she had was not what she was expecting. And Detective Jay Butcher was very honest with Marjorie and said, I get the feeling you have no interest in helping us trying to locate your husband. You don't seem concerned and you don't seem to have any interest in assisting us in any way. And this is how Marjorie responded. I'm going to read it so I get it exactly what she said because it's very strange. Marjorie responded, I speak more matter of factly. That does not mean that I do not care. Just because I'm not running around crying and in hysteria does not mean that I'm not concerned and not doing anything. So your husband is missing and the detective who is working to try to find him this detective is trying to find your missing husband and she was so combative and she didn't want to help them and there's a reason she didn't want to help them. And because of her reluctance, police were suspicious of Marjorie from the very beginning. When police checked Jay's bank account and credit cards, they soon realized that a lot of money was being taken out of his accounts. The signatures on the receipt were signed Jay Orban, but it wasn't Jay who was signing them. They figured out it was Marjorie signing Jay's name. Within days of Jay being missing, they noticed that Marjorie was pulling out money from the ATMs, the largest amount that the ATM would allow her to withdraw every single day. When Marjorie was asked about this, she said she needed money to pay the bills. But when police noticed she bought a $12,000 baby piano, mm, Marjorie, no, no one's, no one's fallen for it anymore. I mean, the police weren't fallen for anything she had to say from the beginning, but it became crystal clear at this point. Starting September 9th, the day after Jay went missing, Marjorie started pulling money out of his accounts and credit cards, as I've mentioned. She ended up taking out over $100,000 from Jay's personal account and from Jay's business accounts. And she was also selling off some of the assets of his business. Now, at this point, 
he's missing and you're selling his assets for his business, it's almost like Marjorie knew Jay wasn't coming home. When police realized that Jay had a $1 million life insurance policy and Marjorie was the beneficiary, they realized that this was not going to end well. Detective Butcher called Marjorie to ask her to come in for a polygraph test and Marjorie became even more combative than she had been in the past. And I have the transcript from a call between Jan Butcher, the detective, and Marjorie. So Detective Butcher calls Marjorie and says, can we schedule a polygraph tomorrow? Marjorie then says, she wants me to take a polygraph tomorrow. And she was obviously speaking to someone else in the room. Larry, remember Larry, the bodybuilder that she's been with? Well, even when Jay was still around, he was coming and living in the home with her the three weeks out of the month that he was gone. Larry says, you can tell her to go fuck herself. Butcher then asked, who's that? And Marjorie said, none of your effing business. It's a friend of mine. Is this conversation being recorded? Butcher then said, yes, it is. And Marjorie said, it is? Okay, I'd like a copy of that. The thing I find so strange about Marjorie is if your husband is missing and we don't know yet in the story if she's responsible, but I think we can all guess if that she is. Why would you not at least try to come across to the police like you cared? Like it's, it's so strange to me that she was so like rude and combative with police who are looking for her missing husband. Like even if you, have done something to him, why would you not want to come across as a concerned wife? It was almost like, like she created the suspicion on herself. And like, can't you just fake it? Like if the police are looking for a missing man, like fake that you care at least. Marjorie though, no, nah, she didn't give a shit. She wasn't even gonna pretend to give a shit. After phone negotiations proved to be unproductive, police obtained a search warrant for Orban's home. And when the SWAT team broke down the door to go in to Jay and Marjorie's home, they were attacked by Larry. And they quickly tased him and hit him and ended up breaking his nose. <sighs> If you have a SWAT team coming into your house, why on earth would you try to attack them? Like you're not going to win. You are not going to win a fight between you, one person, and an entire SWAT team who is literally trained to do this. Like Marjorie and Larry, they just make the weirdest choices. They just, they make themselves look so guilty. And like, don't, I don't understand how neither of them ever considered the idea of trying to appear innocent. Like, it's like, that wasn't even a thought to them because everything they did made them look guilty. And who attacks a SWAT team? Like, come on now. I don't care if you're a bodybuilder. You're not gonna win against an entire SWAT team. <laughs> I don't know. Once inside the house, they found business credit cards and a business checkbook that Jay would normally take on all of his business trips. And Detective Butcher quickly realized that she probably was not looking for a missing person. She was fairly confident that this was a homicide. And on October 23rd, 
a homeless man was walking down the road and it wasn't even a very deserted area. It was within 50 feet of homes and businesses. He came and on October 23rd, a homeless man walking down the street came across a very large object wrapped in black garbage bags. He ripped open the garbage bags and inside was a large blue Rubbermaid container. When he opened the container, he stumbled back in shock. And besides the horrible stench, he was horrified to see a belt buckle around a man's hairy belly. What he had just discovered was a torso. He immediately ran to the nearest store and called police. And police arrived and realized that it was not an entire body. It was a piece of a body. It was a torso. And you look into this case, they give a lot more detail on exactly what was done to his body. I'm going to skip those details. I don't really think in my videos I want to include the gruesome kind of details, but it wasn't good. At the bottom of the container under the torso, they found a 38 caliber bullet and a set of keys with 11 keys on it. There was also mixed currency of about $450. The Rubbermaid container was new and it still had the UPC code on it, which was amazing for police to find. During the autopsy, they discovered that the body had been frozen for an extended period of time. It had then been thawed and it appeared as though the cuts to the body, removing parts, was done by a saw. And again, like my last video, we're back to the frozen bodies and dismembering. As I had mentioned in my last video, I came to discover when investigating these cases that if you freeze a body, not giving advice, don't take this as advice, if you freeze a body and then thaw the body, it somehow makes it easier to cut up and there that, that's that six weeks after jay orban had gone missing they believed they had found his body not far from his home dna later confirmed their suspicion that the part of the body they had found was in fact jay orban they also believed that Marjorie wanted Jay's body to be found because remember, Jay has a $1 million life insurance policy, which Marjorie is the beneficiary of. But to get that life insurance policy, Jay can't be missing. Jay has to be dead. So they believe that she had frozen the body to hide it then realized they've got to find the body to pronounce him dead for me to get the life insurance money. Two days after the torso was found, Jay Orban's green Bronco was found just a few blocks away from his home. Detectives took the keys that they had found in the bottom of the container and one of them started the Ford Bronco. The other keys ended up to be keys that opened Jay's home, Jay's businesses, they were clearly Jay's keys. Three witnesses said they had seen a woman on September 8th around the Bronco and the woman they described matches Marjorie's description. Three weeks after Jay's body was found, police brought Marjorie in for questioning, but she wasn't brought in for questioning for Jay's murder. She was brought in because she had been using Jay's credit cards. And she said that she didn't realize that there was anything wrong with using her husband's credit cards. And I found this a little interesting because 
me and my partner, we use each other's debits and credit cards sometimes. Like sometimes if he's going to the store to get something for me or I'm going to the store to get something for him, we use each other's debit and credit cards. And I didn't know it was a crime. <laughs> I don't really know if that, it's a crime. I don't know if it was a crime because back then she actually, when she used the credit card, she had to sign his signature. So I don't know if it was a crime because she signed his signature. But I also don't know if it's a crime if you tap someone else's card or enter their PIN. Um, I hope it's not a crime because I may be a criminal and not know it. You may be a criminal and not know it. I don't know, guys. We're pretty suspicious. The more investigating police did, the more evidence started to mount up. While searching the Orban home, they found a receipt for Lowe's, a hardware store dated two days after Jay went missing. And what was bought on that receipt? A saw, saw blades, and two blue large 50 gallon Rubbermaid containers. They were the same type of container that Jay's torso was found in. And if you remember that I mentioned the UPC code was still on the container that Jay's torso was found in. And on the receipt that was found in the Orban home, the UPC code was listed and shocker, they matched. They also went to Lowe's to get the CCTV video. And when they, you know, went through the video and they went to the time when these things were purchased, there was Marjorie purchasing a saw, purchasing saw blades, and purchasing two large blue Rubbermaid containers. Guilty! And in Jay's office, they found a package of saw blades with two of them missing. And the medical examiner had discovered during the autopsy that it was most likely that he was cut up using a saw. And back at the Orban home, they found the garage floor had recently been acid washed and a thick layer of decorative epoxy was painted over the cement. And this eliminated any chance of finding any trace of forensic evidence. On, Jan on December 6, 2004, Marjorie was arrested. She was arrested at her home, charged with first degree murder, fraud, and theft. She was held without bail and her son was sent to live with Jay's parents. And initially Larry was a suspect in Jay's murder because he had full access to their home in his car. He had a garage door opener. So there was, he definitely had the means and opportunity to be involved in the crime, but police could find no hard evidence connecting him in any way to the crime. All of the evidence pointed directly at Marjorie. And with a first degree murder charge in the state of Arizona, she was up for the death penalty. And in a controversial move, the prosecution gave Larry full immunity to testify against Marjorie. And it was considered very controversial because many people believed that he was involved, but if the police have no evidence to prove that he was involved, giving him immunity just makes the case stronger against Marjorie because they did suspect him, but no matter how much investigating they did, they could never find anything that connected him in any way to Jay's death. Faced with overwhelming evidence, Marjorie's defense attorney recommended she take a plea deal to hopefully avoid a death sentence. But Marjorie said no. She said to her defense attorney, I will never let my son hear me say that I did this to his father. I will let them kill me first. But you did it, Marjorie. You may not want your son to know you did it, but you did it.
Marjorie spent four years in prison awaiting trial. And as what comes up in many cases when the person has been dismembered, it's always the person was too big and the person trying to dismember them was too small to do it. Jay weighed 250 pounds and they tried to argue there's no way that Marjorie had the physical strength to be able to do this to his body. But Marjorie was not a petite woman. She was very tall and she was in really good shape. She worked out at the gym a lot and she had a lot of month muscle and she had a lot of strength. The, de the defense also tried to claim that Larry had been the one that had killed Jay, but they offered absolutely no evidence to support that claim. The defense pointed out that Larry was aggressive enough to confront a SWAT team. And I mean, you gotta be pretty aggressive to think you're gonna fight a SWAT team. And as a bodybuilder, he was definitely strong enough to be able to dismember and dispose of the body. Prosecution countered this claim, saying Larry was just another man in the long list of Marjorie's infidelities. And she had used many men for her entire life. They also pointed out in the investigation, there was no evidence found that he was involved at all. Prosecution also called a cellmate of Marjorie's from prison who said that Marjorie described Jay as fat and disgusting and that she had shot him, frozen his body, and then dismembered him, which we all know is exactly what she did. The only witness called for the defense was Michael J. Peter, who described Marjorie as a sweet, loving woman who was not capable of committing this crime. He said that she was a loving mother and this did nothing to sway the jury's mind. The trial lasted for eight months and it only took the jury seven hours to come up with a verdict. And at sentencing on October 1st, 2009, the jury sentenced Marjorie to life in prison. She was not given the death penalty because the jury had a lot of sympathy for Marjorie and Jay's son. One of the pr people on the jury, his name was Stan Brown, was quoted as saying, we all decided that the son is an innocent victim here. We all walked out of there feeling good. And to this day, Marjorie still claims that Larry did it all. She claims that she had absolutely nothing to do with the murder, but that she did help cover it up. While she was in prison, she was interviewed by 48 Hours and she claimed that Larry was a very violent man and shot Jay in her garage. She said that Larry had threatened to kill her son if she told the police and she claimed that he told her, it's just that easy to snap that kid's scrawny neck if you don't do what you're told. And though she made these claims to the TV crew, she had never made those claims to the police. And even if they did, who the hell is gonna believe this woman? I don't believe a damn thing she says. And of course, Miss Marjorie and her many men is on a website for people in prison. Marjorie currently has a profile on the website, writeprisoners.com. Let me read you her bio. Growing up in Miami, Florida, the sunshine and water were a big part of my life. Playing on the beach, diving, surfing, sailing, and playing beach volleyball. The little girl in the ballet class was the start of a lifelong love of dance. I had quite a career as a professional dancer and choreographer. From Disney World to cruise ships to Las Vegas shows. Paris, Japan, Germany. I've danced in all of those countries. Even dancing on rock videos. Motley Crue's Girls, Girls, Girls. I was in it. 
traveling all over the world. I've had many exciting adventures. Then one unforeseen incident changed everything. But even now, I do my best to be positive and create a meaningful life for myself. I am strong and healthy and active. I teach aerobics class. I am tall, slender, and have long blonde hair. I have a pretty silly sense of humor. Sometimes I read, watch trashy TV, and stay out of the drama. I miss traveling, good food, the ocean, interesting friends, and romance. I would love to meet new friends from the real world that might share their adventures or maybe just talk. Please write to me directly. Seriously, seriously. So I know they have these websites for people in prison and people in prison deserve loving, you know, there's people in prison who, you know, aren't murderers who maybe do deserve love and they have these websites because there's people who want to talk to people in prison. I'm not going to get into my opinion on any of it because I would sit here talking for an hour and the video was long enough to begin with. But the one question I have is on these websites, do they have to disclose their crime? And do they have to be honest? That's what I really want to know. I want to know like when they sign up for these websites, do they just put in whatever they want as the crime they've committed? Or does the website like verify, okay, they're in jail for this reason? That I want to find out. I may actually, as weird as it sounds, I might go on to one of these websites. I mean, not to look for someone. I'm not single. <laughs> I'm not going on dating websites looking for prisoners to talk to. But it did pique my interest. I really want to know, can they just write whatever they want as their crime? Or is it verified somehow? And I don't know why I'm so interested in that, but I get stuck on weird things you may have noticed. Thank you so much. If you're still here and you've watched the whole video, I love you. If you enjoyed the video, like. If you'd like to see more from me, please subscribe and turn on notifications and you'll be notified each time I upload a new video. Have a beautiful day and I will see you all next time.